Okay, so here I am. Here is uh, my syllabus. And uh, we're starting week two. And these are the links to the four videos I have for this week. And um, let me um, let me talk about something right now that isn't discussed in any of these videos, and it's uh, something that can be very useful. Um, I use Excel to uh, keep track of uh, my grades for this course. And let me show you uh, some convenient items for doing that. So here is sort of a copy of, uh, of my student list for the course here. And you can see I, I can highlight uh, the entire region in which I have. There's first name, uh, surname, and email address. So I'll copy the entire region and make it more convenient for me. Let's say I want to put the list in alphabetical order by first name, and it's not in order right now. Uh, so let's see if I can remember how to do that. Uh, so I select the entire list right in here like that. OK, uh, now I could select any number of columns here and I want to select the entire list for what I'm trying to do. And so I select the entire list because uh, when, when I resort the order of these names, I want everything on the row to follow the name. If I just selected the first column, it would only reorder these names and it wouldn't reorder anything in any of the other columns. So I select the entire region here. Now, uh, I want to sort things in alphabetical order. So let's see, I believe I go to data. OK, yep, here and right here. There's sort. So I'll click on sort. And it's got um, sort by column B. Uh, and values just means the, the content. So in this case, they're not numbers, they're words. So it will sort them in alphabetical order. But I don't want to do column B, I want to do column A. So I'll go to column A, and now I'll click OK, and you see it changes everything here, and now the list is sorted by alphabetical order. So this way, when you send in homeworks uh, with your name on them, I don't have to go searching through the entire list to see where your name is on the list to record a grade because I know that the, I have the list in alphabetical order by first name. I could put them in alphabetical order by surname. So let me show you that. I, again, I select the entire list like this and sort. And now I want to do column B there. Now I hit OK. So now it sorts them in alphabetical order by surname in column B. Uh, and um, which is um, uh, so either way I prefer I could you know I could resort the names now it's uh, uh, what makes this particularly convenient is is just about every day over this past week uh, someone has sent me an email uh, saying that they wanted to be added to the course so I add the name just at the bottom. So I'll put the person's name and email address in the bottom. Then I go back in and I resort the list. So it then inserts their name in the location uh, in alphabetical order. So putting things in alphabetical order is uh, is frequently very important uh, in making the job easier. So I just wanted to show you how to do that. Um, 
also, uh, I mention in the syllabus, let me go back to the syllabus now. Let me just close this out right here. Here, save, I'll save it. Okay, now in the syllabus, I give you sort of a, a, a mini project for the Excel part of the course. And let me describe that mini project. I give you a link and I download uh, data from a European website. And it's uh, this particular European website collects all of the COVID-19 uh, data from every country in the world. That's a, it's a huge Excel list, you see it here, right? And basically what I want you to do is do whatever you want with this data, you know, do some comparisons. And um, so you know, the data has the countries in alphabetical order, it starts with Afghanistan and keeps going down and down and down. And at the very bottom, Zimbabwe is the last country on the list. And so what's the data that's in here? Uh, we have, it adds new data every day and it adds data at the top of the list uh, for each country. So uh, when I, I downloaded this a few days ago, uh, so here is September the 12th um, and um, so here's day, month, year 12 9 2020 the number of cases that uh, in this case afghanistan report, reported 34 number of deaths uh, country here's an abbreviation uh, population of the country uh, continent asia and cumulative number for 14 days of covid 19 cases per 100,000 population. So let's look at that column for a minute because that's not giving you the total accumulated number of cases, but by the way I read this, it's giving you the total number of cases uh, over the past 14 days. And it's, it's, it's doing that, it's, it's doing a, what's called a running average. Um, so every new day that comes in, they add the data for the new day and they drop off the data, the oldest data from 14 days ago. And it, so it's smoothing out that sum. It's, it's a way of smoothing the data because as you might imagine, the data jumps around a bit from one day to the next. So the idea is by smoothing the data over an interval, we are um, we are getting a a better trend of the data that um, doesn't include this jumping around from day to day. So we're seeing is the data generally increasing or is it generally decreasing? And um, so. That's what this is. It's the sum over the last 14 days of the data here that's collected. So it's probably uh, looking at these most recent 14 numbers here, and um, and then adding um, uh, adding it up and uh, and putting that number right there. Okay. Now I'm not quite sure. I haven't checked it myself, so I haven't checked all of this, but I'm taking it on their word. Cumulative number for 14 days per cases of 100,000. So it'll take 14 days and then it will divide by uh, the population of the country, which is why this country's, uh, why this data is here. And notice that all these numbers are the same. So even though we do know that the population of the country is changing from day to day. People are born, people die, so changing from day to day. Uh, 
they they're not updating this population every day. They're, they're probably not updating it for the entire period of this chart. So they're adding up 14 numbers and writing this in terms of uh, hundreds of thousands. Right now, it looks like it might be in millions, right? Um, so uh, uh, 38 million, 41,757 seems like a reasonable population for Afghanistan. And uh, so writing this in terms of instead of individuals, writing this as a number of hundreds of thousands. So how many hundreds of thousands in, in 38 million? Uh, so we got to divide this by um, 100,000. Well, let's see. 1,000 is 10 cubed. 10,000 is 10 to the fourth. 100,000 is 10 to the sixth. So it would be this number divided by 10 to the uh, um, 100,000, 10 to the fifth, not 10 to the sixth. 10 to the fifth. So this number divided by 10 to the fifth is the number of hundreds of thousands. And I think that gets divided into this sum. So you can, we can check that here if we want it. Um, suppose I, uh, suppose I wanted to add these 14 numbers, top 14 numbers here. So I could click there and I put sum open and now I want to do Okay, here are the number of cases. Sorry, I said these numbers, but here are the number of cases. So, I'm going to do here. I, I see I, I made a mistake here when I was writing this in. And if you were uh, really observant, you would have seen the mistake. I forgot to add an equal sign. So I got to put equals. Let me do it up here. Equal. There, equal. Now I want to do sum. Here's sum. Now I want to put in this number. So I just click here and I want to go down 14. So this is going two. So uh, let me, let me, I'll just count down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So as expected, since I started at row two, I'm at 15. So right here. So I want to do I want to do E2 to E15. I put a colon and then I'll click on this and hit return. So this is the sum of the number of cases is this. But I want to divide that by um, uh, the number of hundreds of thousands in the population. And um, so it would be uh, this number divided by um, 10 to the fifth. That's the number of hundreds of thousands. And that should um, give us, hopefully, if uh, I'm interpreting this exactly, if I'm interpreting the way they've computed this number. Uh, so uh, if I write this, let me let me just do that calculation separately right here so you can see it. I'll put equal. Now, how do I compute the number of hundreds of thousands? I'll click on this number, that, and I want to divide it by 100,000. So I'll just put divide by one. There's 100,000, so I just wrote that out. So. This is this right here. Now I want to take this and divide it into that number. So let me just do that calculation right here. I want to do equals. This divided by this. And I get. I get 1.25 here, so they got 1.22, so they're Looks like they might be doing that calculation a bit differently, uh, but it's very close. So maybe they're rounding things off a bit. I'm not sure, but it's certainly in the ballpark. 
So this is how I interpreted them as, as doing that number. Cumulative number for 14 days of COVID-19 cases per 100,000 population. So, 100,000 population. Okay. Now, um, so this um, number here is better than just looking at the cumulative number because it's normalized by the population of a country, right? You would expect a large country to have more cases, but uh, what you're interested in is the number of cases per capita. How many cases uh, per population? Now, something else let me mention here um, is that um, I look at these numbers and especially number of cases, cumulative cases in the population. I, I actually, you know, these numbers seem to be way off for me because if in fact we only had 1.2 cases per 100,000 population, uh, I mean, COVID-19 would not be a serious epidemic because Sir, yeah sorry for interrupting you can you open the excel uh, full screen we can see it okay i'll i'll expand it out here let's see Thank you. I, i'm going to go to um, uh, view and go to 200 there oh. yes thank you oh. okay so so these numbers generally here don't make complete sense to me. Uh, I'm it, what it's telling me is that uh, probably most countries are uh, miscounting their number of cases and and every or certainly not counting them in a way that makes sense to me because I would expect there to be more than one case per 100,000 population here. Um, and as you go down, you see these numbers are changing dramatically. Uh, you know, in Afghanistan, here we could see a peak here in this region right in here, where the number of cases is getting very large per 100,000 population. So basically, we can pretty much, I'm, I'm hoping that the, uh, however the country is choosing to count their cases, that they're doing it in a consistent way from one week to the next and with that i'm not i'm not a hundred percent confident either because um i actually went to kyrgyzstan and i plotted out the uh, number of uh, cases in kyrgyzstan over a period so let's look at that so first of all how you know kyrgyzstan is way down on the list i can scroll down like this um, I could go up here to edit and um, find, find, and now type KYRG. I'm assuming that's enough to find Kyrgyzstan, and here we are right here. So here's where Kyrgyzstan starts, and uh, then it goes down for some period here. So it looks like Kyrgyzstan is probably doing, I, I would say, a more reasonable job at counting their cases than Afghanistan, because I would assume, maybe incorrectly, that it doesn't make sense that Afghanistan would have one case per 100,000 population when Kyrgyzstan has 17. I think Kyrgyzstan is just doing a better job counting their numbers here. Okay, so... Um, so I can look at the data. Notice, by the way, that the most recent data is at the top of the list of the country. So I could go down here and select a bunch of, and so let me just select a bunch of numbers here. Let me click on this, come down to some point right here. I st Kyrgyzstan apparently wasn't even reporting data right in here. But I'll go all the way down to here, click on that. So I'm selecting that whole bunch of numbers. 
and and let me graph it because typically graphing the data we can get a better idea what's uh, going on than just looking at the numbers for our bodies our brains are designed to look at visual information and interpret it now looking at the numbers uh, takes is more difficult for us to interpret so i just wanted to get a quick view of what's going on here in kyrgyzstan so i select those numbers and then i go to um, I want to go, I want to do a quick graph. So I, if you remember, uh, charting the data is on insert. So I go here and here we have recommended charts. And uh, so let me just click on this. So here is the plot of the data. Now, by the way, it's this is the most recent data and this is the early data. So this chart is typically is backwards the way we usually read charts. So I could either remember that time going forward is actually going this way. And we go along here, this is time going backward. So we might want to swap the order in which we want to, we might want to make these numbers over here be down here by the origin of the graph. So we're putting the data in the order that we usually uh, read charts. And uh, so, say I want to do that, but you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't do that a lot, so I don't remember exactly how to do that. And so I have to figure out how to swap the order on the x-axis. And um, so this might take a few minutes while I figure it out. Now, if you remember, I told you uh, earlier uh, last week that when you don't know how to do something, you know, don't throw up your hands and give up, but try to search around and find it because everything is out there. And in particular, let me go to, uh, let me pull up my browser here. And here I have, uh, I did this. I, I did a Google search for Excel. I type in Excel because that's the software I'm using. And then I say Excel, swap the order of X axis in a chart. So I do a Google search for that and a bunch of things come up. In particular, this comes up. Excel includes controls for quickly switching the order of axis values. To make this change, right click and open up axis options in the Format task pane. Okay, well, you know, this is already talking about stuff. I don't, I'm not quite sure what they're what they're talking about. Uh, near the bottom, you'll see ch a checkbox called values in reverse order. Okay, so as I said, I generally prefer to go into YouTube because YouTube a video pops up and I watch the video and it and it just does all this so I can see how they do it here. They explain how to do it, and if I don't know what items they're talking about, it's it still leaves me a bit confused and befuddled. But um, so uh, what you might want to do here is rather than just go into Google and do a search, do a search in YouTube. But uh, before doing that, let's see if I can't figure this out. Uh, remember, I told you that we, uh, when we want to try to figure something out in almost any software, we click on something. There, I clicked on the numbers on the bottom here, and you see it selects all those numbers. And then, if I right click, I have change chart type, select data, add grid lines, format axis, I don't know, maybe format axis. I do format axis and automatically select based on data, text axis, vertical axis positions, tick marks, number, label, okay. Categories in reverse order. Ha ha, that looks promising. I click on that and, and bingo, that gives me what I want. Okay, so 
I've gone through this. I figured out how to do what I want to do by doing a Google search. Although I'm recommending probably YouTube might be more instructive. And then uh, right clicking to get the options available. And I found an option that might work. So, OK, we're well, OK, so now this is going from a long time ago up to more recent time. And then I have this right in here and now I have this drop off right in there. So. This part of the chart. Looks good to me. This is how I would expect the data to behave. Th these things right in here, these jumps right in here, these kind of bother me because I typically. Wouldn't expect. If you're, you're looking at real data and the real number of illnesses, I would not expect to see all of a sudden a big jump in the number of illnesses per 100 population and then to have that go along and then all of a sudden see a big drop like that. You know, and um, so. I'm a, th this is. This is setting off an alarm bell for me, you know, is uh, what's going on here because this is typically not the way I see things behaving over time. I would expect to see a gradual increase and then a leveling off and then a gradually decrease. But like I said, this part of the chart looks like I expected to look. And um, if we didn't do that 14 day running average, this thing would be jumping all around as we go down here. So uh, doing that 14 day average smooths this out quite a bit and you can see we get this exponential drop off right in there so that this seems reasonable to me so i'm saying probably from this point on down uh the chart makes sense chart doesn't make sense in this region i don't know what's going on maybe somebody recording the data in the chart made a mistake i don't know but it, it's a question in my mind. And um, so. What I'm suggesting, I think it would it would be and you know, be interesting to do some comparisons for this COVID infection data uh, on a country by country or region by region basis. And um, so you might want to grab a couple of Central Asian countries such as you know Kyrgyzstan and and uh, uh, Kazakhstan and Tajikistan uh, and grab a few countries uh, look at their infection data and then compare those with another set of countries perhaps in a different part of the world perhaps looking at some South American countries like uh, uh, Brazil and Argentina and Bolivia uh, compare and so just do some comparison to get some idea. When did a country reach its peak infection rate, and uh, how does the data behave over time? So I'm just suggesting that you uh, that you look uh, look at this and and see if you can draw some conclusions from it. Now this is a massive set of data. You know, you'll know, see this is already we're at uh, column 21,875. So this is way down you know, where we start at the top of the chart in Afghanistan. And see, we're only halfway down the chart. I go all the way down here to the bottom. This is down to 42,000. And um, so this is a huge uh, chart. So. I mean, so there's no way you can look at all these numbers and read the numbers and pick up trends and data. You have to grab sections of the chart and do some graphs. So I'm um, asking you to take all this data and perhaps look at some trends in the data. And uh, you can also possibly get an idea of where the uh, uh, what countries might be uh, not having completely accurate data 
And I'm not sure that any country is actually providing completely accurate data because the countries are counting COVID infections differently. And um, some countries, if someone dies, and no matter what they die from, if they came in with COVID, that will be counted as a COVID death. But with other countries, someone might have COVID, but they might die from a stroke. And they don't take into account that the stroke was related to the COVID infection. They count it as a stroke death, and therefore it's not added to their COVID statistics. And since each country does this assessment differently, uh, we're not getting consistent uh, numbers from one country to the next. Uh, so it's uh, you have to figure out how you might take into account that issue. So the reason why I put this out here uh, and ask you to look at it, because you now correct me if I'm wrong, if you're comms and media person, one of the areas that you might become employed in would be in the um, uh, journalism area. And journalists need to be able to, a good journalist, I would think, needs to be able to look at things, to try to analyze what they mean, and draw some conclusions, and then write an article on it. So I, I'm making this data available. You can go on and download the most recent data. I think I give you a link. There's a European agency that is keeping all the data for all these countries where I downloaded this from, and I think I have the link somewhere on the syllabus. And uh, so look, like I said, look and see what they're actually listing in the columns. Here are deaths. Now, it might make more sense to look at deaths per 100,000 population rather than cases because now I could be wrong here, but as I said, different countries will count things differently um, and uh, they may not be counting all the cases because they don't count a case unless someone goes into a hospital and um, they um, are, and a death isn't counting as a COVID case unless a person is, is in the hospital. So it might be interesting to look at a graph of deaths and a graph of infections per 100 population, you would expect those to track along together. And uh, so there are a lot of ways you can look at the data, try to figure out how to analyze it so that it makes sense, and then um, uh, uh, see if you can draw any conclusions from it. Um, I showed um, this data to uh, to the rector a few days ago, and uh, he was curious as to what's happening in Pakistan because he said Pakistan is one of those countries that all of a sudden had a, a a sudden and dramatic drop in the number of cases they're recording, and uh, so he would like to he would be interested in how the data from Pakistan looks. And because sometimes what happens, I think that almost every country, there is a temptation to downplay the number of cases. And that's certainly true. You know, Trump in the United States, Mr. Donald Trump, he would like to downplay the number of cases. And he's running into some problems doing that because the people in the uh, Center for Disease Control in the United States who count the number of cases feel ethically obligated to re actually report the true data. And even though Trump is trying to tell them to modify how they report the data. And uh, so I'm suspecting that every country, uh, the leaders in the country want to downplay the data. So um, um, 
I'm suspicious of every number I look at. And uh, I, and I apologize to that. I'm just a suspicious person. It's like I can remember when um, I'd be uh, teaching when I was back at Purdue all those years ago, and I'd be teaching a course in uh, probability and random processes. And a student would come in and they tell me, you know, that their grandmother died and they you know, had to go home for that for a few, a few days. And um, I, uh, I would swear there are some students that had their grandparents die five or six times. And um, so uh, I, I would joke with them, uh, bring me in a copy of the death certificate and uh, maybe you shouldn't joke about people's grandparents dying, but I have no uh, no empathy whatsoever. So um, now, so here's the data collected, worldwide data by country, massive amount of the data. So I'm just putting this out here and I'm just saying, do some analysis on the data see if looking at the data you can draw some conclusions and i'm letting you decide what kind of analysis you want to do and, um, and so it's it's not it, it's uh not supposed to be a massive project but i um, just want to get you to look at doing some things with excel and admitting that you're not going to know how to do everything and you have to figure out how to do some things just as I had to figure out how to swap the axis on the graph. OK, so I want you to. Uh, uh, to look at this data. OK, now. Um, in the assignments for this week, let me pull up my syllabus again. Right in here, we're in week two, and I have some videos that I recorded uh, actually months ago. I started doing this, working on the assumption that I might be teaching this course. If I wasn't going to be teaching, I'm, I was pretty sure I could probably use the videos for something else down the road. And um, one of the things where I've used Excel is if um, I go to a bank and I get a loan for buying something. Um, might get a loan for buying a house, a mortgage loan, get a loan for buying a car, get a loan for something or another. And then the, the banks have a formula that they use for computing uh, what you owe them on the loan. And uh, you probably have studied this at some point in school, maybe in high school. How do you compute what banks, how banks can determine what you owe? And it's called loan amortization. And uh, so I have some examples here where I first ask the question, you deposit money in a bank and then you earn interest on the deposit in the bank. How would you compute the interest that you earn? And that's easier calculation than loan amortization. How do you calculate what you owe when you borrow the money? And then I also discuss in here loan amortization. How do you calculate what you owe? And, and uh, so I look at these videos and because the, these are useful things to understand and it's uh, I've done the, these calculations when I borrow money because I don't know how it is where, where you guys are living but I go in the bank and say I want to uh, borrow money to buy a car and they turn to their computer screen they type out a chart and they say if you pay this much back every month this is how long it will take to pay back the loan and and uh, this is what you need to pay and this is what your total accumulated um, 
uh, interest payment is, that's the extra money that you're paying the bank. And uh, I would always check their calculations and do the calculations for myself. And um, so I think this is loan amortization is a useful thing to understand. So that's in, embedded in one of these videos here somewhere. Um, I asked you to uh, grab some functions, trig functions. Okay, you remember trig, right? You studied that probably in uh, pre-calculus, you did some trig. And uh, so let me just quick look at that here. Uh, again, it's covered in detail in the video. Let me find, let me pull up Excel again. Here's Excel. So I'll do new, so here's a new chart. View 200, there we go. So, uh, trig functions, I want to uh, put an angle down here and let's say compute the, the sine of the angle. And um, if you remember, there are two, two ways that people usually use to measure an angle. One is in degrees where we say there are 360 degrees all the way around the circle. And the other is radians where we say there are two pi radians in a circle. And the degrees in particular, the degree as an angle measure is completely arbitrary. Now, who decided that there are 360 degrees in a circle. Uh, that has been lost in history. Who made that decision? And why not 400 degrees in a circle? Or why not 100 degrees in a circle? But for some reason, it's 360 degrees. Now, the radians met definition makes more sense. There's a, a mathematical justification for how um, uh, and why radians are used. And that has to do with the fact that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi times the diameter of a circle. And uh, that 2 pi comes into play. We're saying that the, uh, so we go all the way around the circle, we multiply 2 pi uh, times uh, the radius. I'm sorry, I said diameter, 2 pi times the radius. And radians is related to the, the radius of a circle and the arc length that you, that you uh, cover with that angle. So radians actually has a mathematical basis and, and uh, degrees doesn't have a math mathematical basis. It's completely arbitrary. And Excel, by default, when you're computing things like sine and cosine and tangent assumes that the angle is in radians. And, uh, but I think that usually people, when they're talking about angles, usually people think in degrees. I do, I don't know how you guys do, because degrees is what we first learn in school. You know, 90 degrees is a right angle, for, for instance. So, you might put the angle here down in degrees. So we may go, um, let's say I'll start off with zero and maybe I'll go to five degrees will be the next angle. So I'm gonna do angle in degrees. I probably should put a heading up here that says uh, angle in degrees and, and, and I haven't done that. So I apologize, but I'm gonna keep on going. So now I wanna carry this down for a while. So. How do I do? I can click here and then drag down. That clicks, that selects both cells. And then I go down. Let's say I want to go down to 360. See the number here, the little number showing up. So I go down to 360. Almost there. Here we go. 360. So this is the angle, but the angle is in degrees. Excel wants the angle in radians. So I have to convert from degrees to radian. So here I'll convert to degrees to radian. I'll put equal. 
Now I know that um, 180 degrees is pi radians. So if I want to convert degrees to radians, I want to take these numbers here. I want to multiply each of these numbers by pi divided by 180. So I can say here I'm going to put in my formula to convert this number in degrees to radians. So I put equal. I want to take this number. That's that, that number right there. And then I want to multiply by. Now to convert it to radians, I want to multiply by radians divided by degrees. Now there are pi radians. Now pi, now how do I write pi in Excel? I think it's just pi and then I think that's pi and divide by 180. I think that will convert. So zero degrees is zero radians, five degrees. Is that right? Um, well, I can drag this all the way down. Let's say uh, 180 degree, 180 degrees, if you remember, is supposed to be pi radians. So let's see if that works out. Let me drag this down. I'll drag it all the way down to 360 right there. Well, this looks like it's 2 pi. If you remember, pi is 3.14152654, which you probably don't remember. But when I was a kid, being the nerd that I was, it was considered a measure of my intellect to see how many places I could memorize pi to, at least some people. I I only memorized pi to the precision of the computer that I was using and uh, because that's all you needed when doing calculations in a computer is you know how many digits will the computer accurately represent and I re memorized pi to that number so that's the number that's stuck in my head uh, computers can do a lot more digits now but uh, uh, so I usually don't write pi I have a symbol that represents pi. So here's the symbol pi open paren close paren that represents pi in Excel. So this formula converts this angle in degrees into radians. So here's the angle in radians. Now I want to compute the sine of that angle. I'll put equals sine and then open paren click, close print. Now, I'm writing these all as functions in separate columns. You could actually compress all this and, and write things just in one column, but I'm, I'm spreading it out here. So the sign of zero radians is zero, and I happen to know that's right. You may remember what the sign of 90 degrees is. So let me drag this down, go to 90 degrees, which is right here. The sine of 90 degrees is 1. OK, I remember sine of 90 degrees is 1, so this is looking right. You might also remember the sine of 30 degrees is a half. So that is, um, that. this all looks right. So let me drag it all the way down to 360. Right here. So there's the value of sine in five degree increments, sine of zero, sine of five degrees, sine of 10 degrees, and so on. And something else you should notice, because you may have discussed this in pre-calculus, but maybe you didn't, is that for, for small values of the angle, the sine of the angle is about equal to the value of the angle in radians. And you see down here for small values, of the angle. So let's say from 0, 5 degrees, 10 degrees, 0 radians, 0 0.087 radians, and so on. Look, sine 0 radians, the sine of 0 radians is 0. The sine of this number of radians is this. Sine of this in radians is this. So you see that the sine is approximately equal to the angle in radians. That's a property of 
of doing of the sine and doing the calculation in radians. Then um, we could uh, do a quick and dirty graph. Probably the easiest way to check to see if your calculations are right. So I click and then I shift click down here. That selects everything and I go to insert. And I'll come over here. Um, and uh, here's my charts. Let's recommended charts right here. And you might say, gee, that looks just like a sign. And uh, so you feel now more confident that your calculations are correct. And uh, but notice the x axis isn't in degrees or radians. What the x axis here is the column number. So you might want to put that, you might want to try to figure out how to do this plot so that this is the angle in degrees. And uh, I, rather than answer that question right now, uh, what I will do is uh, let you puzzle on that a bit, uh, get, get some practice looking at, um, again, looking at how to do graphs in Excel and how to set up your coordinates on the X axis and the Y axis. So here, if I'm not putting in an X axis, it automatically plots the row number down here. So that's the row number. So instead of going from zero to row 73 here, I might want to go from zero to 360 degrees. So, um, I'll let you try to figure out how to do that for now. And uh, like I said, uh, you can find this in a zillion places online. So you can go into YouTube and uh, and search around and you, you'll probably find 20 videos on how to do that. OK, so. That. Uh, that's all I have here that I want to say right now. Uh, and most people got their homeworks in. Uh, by the time uh, that I ask you to and thank you for that. Uh, one or two people uh, forgot to put their name. On the uh, title for the file, so please. Remember to do that because uh, I, if I download all the files individually and then I have a file, but there's not a name on it, then I can't tell by looking at the file who submitted that file. I have to go back and, and look at the mail again and see who submitted that file. So it uh, makes things a lot more convenient for me if you put your name. Right in the front of the name of the file, so please try to remember to do that. So with this. Um, that's everything I want to say right now. Uh, we can uh, talk a little bit on uh, on Thursday and. Uh, maybe. Uh, uh, Thursday. If, peop if some people have started looking at this project and maybe a few people will have. Uh, you can tell me some of the things that you're thinking about on the project. And remember, I said I want the project, uh, the Excel project, uh, submitted before we hit the uh, semester break. So that's about halfway through the semester. It's on the syllabus. Let me go back to the syllabus. Where are we? So right here, midterm break. So before the midterm break, I want you to submit that little Excel project on the COVID. Uh, and uh, like I said, you can figure out anything that you want to look at because the purpose here isn't to do a deep analysis of COVID infection. The purpose is for you to understand how to use Excel to analyze data. So. I'm just looking to have you learn a little bit more about Excel and how to do these things in Excel. This is why I've assigned the project. 
Okay, so with that, I'm done. Uh, let me uh, go. Let me go back to face to face. See if anybody has any questions. Okay. Hello there, people. Anybody have any questions on stuff? Okay, I don't hear anything. So I, that means, of course, that everything was perfectly clear. Um, if anybody is just completely confused and completely lost, please send me an email so we can chat and catch up a, a bit on this because this is not that difficult. And... Um, so if you're just completely confused and completely lost, I want to get you to the place where you're not confused and lost. So send me, uh, okay, there's, we have a, a hand here. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, the hand disappeared. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, I have a question about our assignments. So yes. the syllabus, there are different uh, links to... Uh, YouTube videos, right? So do we have to yeah. watch all of them and then complete our homework like every week? Um, I regret that I really would like you to watch all the videos. And I think most of the videos are about 20 minutes long. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would like you to look at all the videos, in fact, um, and understand them. I want you to look at the videos and understand them. And uh, so that, yeah, that's what I'm asking you to do. Like I said, I'm looking to see that you're learning how to use Excel. So number one in importance is looking at the videos and then uh, you just make a reasonable effort at looking at the homework. Let's go down to the homeworks here. So homeworks for week two. So week two, um, I mentioned using the, um, looking at some um, week two. I mentioned the project here, pick several countries, compute the data according to each country's population. Uh, so here I have problem number one, which is, a simple interest rate calculation here, which I, uh, but I, I didn't talk about loan amortization. So this is a, a loan amortization question. So to do this answer, you should look at loan amortization. And then this is describing a little bit here, right in here, what the, what the project is using COVID. And here's a link to the European data site that has the COVID data. So there's there's one homework question here that I want you to turn in uh, on uh, Sunday night coming up. And then this is a discussion on, on the pro Excel project. So there's not a, a lot of homework, just this one question here for this week. And then I want to get you thinking about um, the COVID project. So, yeah, please look at the videos. And uh, so you, you look at the video, you should see the video describes how to do this. So that's mm -hmm. why, you know, that's why I want you to look at the video. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Are you disappointed in the answer? No. Okay. Um, okay, good. Any other uh, questions here? Okay, um, uh, here's another hand. Yeah, go ahead. Good time of the day. So um, I'm a new student in this group and I submitted my homework through email. Yes. And is it okay if we keep doing it until you, until the model 
Yeah, I, well, in fact, I want you to submit it in email. Soft. That's that's how I want you to do it. I want you not to do it with Moodle. I want you to do it with email. I want okay. you to send it with email because uh, <laughs> they keep, you know, um, it, I, I find it um, annoying and frustrating. It seems like they add a new piece of software every few months. So by the you figure out how to use an old piece of software, then they throw something new in there that confuses everything. And uh, email is the first application ever on the internet. So submit your homeworks by email, okay? And um, that's how I want you to do it. That's less likely to be messed up somehow because they've changed a piece of software. So submit them by email. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I uh, I guess that's it then. Uh, everybody, uh, you know, have a good time. If you have any questions, email and um, uh, stop recording. Stop recording.